Welcome to House of the Dragon Lore. So we found out that Raman Javadi has been signed on to compose the soundtrack for House of the Dragon. And this is fabulous news as he composed the soundtrack for Game of Thrones, which is and always will be iconic. Like, who doesn't know the Game of Thrones theme song? Even people who don't watch the show know the theme song and... And obviously they know, oh, that's Game of Thrones. I still get goosebumps when I hear the Targaryen theme music. It just reminds me of those intense moments with Daenerys and her dragons. I have faith in Raman Javadi, and I'm sure it's going to be amazing work, whatever he does with the um, soundtrack. I wonder, will he incorporate some of the same from Game of Thrones, or will it all be original? So I'm very happy about this choice, and I'm hoping to get some sneak peeks soon. Um, otherwise, I don't really have any news about House of the Dragon. Today, seeing that this episode of my Dragon series will deal with the most dark and airy dragon of the series, I also wanted to mention darkness that parallels the Targaryens. And I know that George R. R. Martin is not a racist in any way, and I want to put that out there before I continue on with this. These are just some parallels that stuck out to me. I mean, maybe he didn't even notice. Maybe it was in his subconscious. I don't know, but I know he didn't mean it in a racist manner. So the dragon riders, the Valerians, have pale skin and pale hair with violet, green, or blue eyes. And Aryans are considered to be a master race distinguished with light hair, skin, and eyes. And the Nazis attempted to keep this bloodline pure. Just like the Valerians wanted to keep their bloodline pure, but their blood they wanted to keep their bloodline pure for the fact of magic and the fact they can bomb with dragons. But of course the Nazis, like that whole thing is just crazy. But all the same, it's still very interesting. Also, the use of red and black as House Targaryen's colors. That mirror the red and black of the Nazi party, not to mention that Targaryen has the word Aryan included in its name. And did Danny's speech in the last episode of the series not remind you of Hitler's speeches? You can just pause this um, episode right now and go listen to or just glance at one of Hitler's speeches. I know it's dark and everything and I don't like watching it either, but... um. You'll see the similarities. And Amelia Clark even used video of his speeches to prepare her for that moment, for the big speech. And she's on record saying that. You can find it if you search for it. Although George R. R. Martin leads us to believe that there is something powerful and magic in certain bloodlines, he also from time to time reminds us that bloodlines actually mean nothing. Who we are, how capable we are, and what we can and can't do is what is essential for our destiny. Not the family someone is born into, nor the bloodline they belong to. From my point of view, he is pointing out how rash the whole Aryan race thing is, and that there isn't any one race more vulnerable or stronger, and it's more of how power corrupts people and divides people using weapons of mass destruction that either side has in their possession. For instance, the Targaryens have dragons. And in the A Song of Fire and Ice world, dragons are the nuclear bomb. They're the weapons of mass destruction. And obviously, that's why the Valerians had power, and that's why the Targaryens had power, and that's why Dany had her power. She also had all the armies backing her up. That helped as well. And George is brilliant in that way, and he has mentioned many times that the realities of war are jarring. So it's something to think about. I wonder, did he even think of it at all when he was writing? But I just happened to notice, like I said, the similarities, and I'm, I know other people have as well. I read a bit on Reddit about it. There is some stuff out there, so it's just something interesting to point out. All right, so... 
The cannibal is the most fearsome, ancient, and mysterious dragon who lived during the Dance of the Dragons. His exact age was never stated. He was said to reside on Dragonstone before the Targaryens even settled on the island. He was said to lurk up on the Dragon Mount, and the Dragon Mount is a smoking volcano, and he used to lurk up there waiting for his next meal. He's the only dragon during the Dance of Dragons that wasn't eventually mounted, as he would tear apart any supposed dragon seed. And a dragon seed is um, small folk lived on the island of Dragon Dragonstone as well. Like they, I guess they grew vegetables, they made weapons. There was a small folk on the island, and some of them were called dragon seeds because the Targaryen kings and the male Targaryens would hook up with the small folk ladies, and of course there would be bastard children. And so they got the name Dragon Seeds. Any supposed dragon seed that tried to have Cannibal bend his neck to them would die. I'm pretty sure he was even older than Balerion the Black Dread, to be honest. Which would have made him a bigger dragon than Balerion as well. So, like, he was massive. They wouldn't probably be able to show how big he actually was in the show that might be difficult and he was black as cold with mean green eyes there are fan theories about the cannibal which are very intriguing and make some sense and they're mostly to be found on fan groups on reddit if you want to go check that out here's a quote i'm going to read from fire and blood the largest and oldest of the wild dragons was the cannibal so named because he had been known to feed on the carcasses of dead dragons and descend upon the hatcheries of Dragonstone to gorge himself on newborn hatchlings and eggs. Coal black with baleful green eyes, the cannibal had made his lair on Dragonstone even before the coming of the Targaryens, some small folk claimed. Grandmaster Munkin and Septon Eustace both found this story most unlikely. Would-be dragon tamers had made attempts to ride him a dozen times. His lair was littered with their bones. So Cannibal was one of the three completely wild dragons that were dwelling on Dragonstone, along with Sheepstealer and Grey Ghost. The Cannibal may have come from a different lineage of dragons altogether, So that might explain why he was so rival to the other Targaryen dragons. However, some maesters doubt these claims. You know, it seems that the maesters doubt all the fun claims. And then, like, Mushroom the Fool, he would tell all the, like, all the tea, all the good gossip about the Targaryens. So, like, you don't know who to believe, but, like, it kind of, like, the maesters remind me of the government, like, covering up things. So I like to believe the more salacious things that I hear. So prior to the Dance of the Dragons, the would-be dragon tamers had made attempts to ride him numerous times, and his lair was littered with their bones. When Prince Jacaris Valerian called for dragon riders in 129 AC, none of the dragon seeds who attempted to tame the wild dragons were foolish enough to disturb the cannibal due to his reputation. And any who were did not return to tell the tale. However, when Silver Danies tried to master Sheep Stealer, the dragon tore off his arm. As his son struggled to mend his wound, the cannibal descended on them and drove off Sheep Stealer and devoured Silver Danies and his sons. So that's how the cannibal was. And that's why I said he's the darkest dragon literally in color and in spirit. During the Dance of the Dragons, the carcass of Grey Ghost was discovered at the Dragon Mount's base. Burned and broken, torn apart, and partially devoured. People were quick to name the cannibal as the killer, but when but it was in fact Sunfire. Some of the fisher folk began to worry that the dragon would attack them as well. They wanted night to 
kill the cannibal, but they were refused, reasoning that if they left the dragon alone, he would not bother them, and forbid fishing in the waters to the east of the Dragonmont. And that's where Grey Ghost's body had been found. However, Damon's daughter, Lady Bela Targaryen, who was at the time basically incarcerated on Dragonstone by the Greens, Lady Bela Targaryen was not satisfied with the explanation and she wanted to discover the truth herself about the death of Grey Ghost. And she had no fear of the cannibal and her dragon Moondancer could outfly him because Moondancer was a really young dragon. But Sir Robert Quince barred her from taking the risk and confined her to her chambers. So that's no fun. And here's another quote from Fire and Blood. Dragons were a wonder to the men of old Volantis. The sight of two in battle was one the men of Nazaria would never forget. Those born and bred on Dragonstone had grown up with such beasts. Yet even so, the sailor's story excited interest. The next morning, some local fisher folk took their boats around the dragon mount and returned to report seeing the burned and broken remains of a dead dragon at the mountain's base. From the color of its wings and scales, the carcass was that of Grey Ghost. The dragon lay in two pieces and had been torn apart and partially devoured. On hearing this news, Sir Robert Quince, the amiable and famously obese knight whom the queen had named Castellan of Dragonstone upon her departure, was quick to name the cannibal as the killer. Most agreed, for the cannibal had been known to attack smaller dragons in the past, though seldom so savagely. Some amongst the fisher folk, fearing that the killer might turn upon them next, urged Quince to dispatch knights to the beast's lair to put an end to him. But the Castellan refused. If we do not trouble him, the cannibal will not, will not trouble us. And it was also said, this is a little interesting tidbit, that um, during the burial at sea for Corlys Valerion, the cannibal took wing and and flew to salute the deceased. But, of course, Archmaester Glendane notes that this may be a later establishment of the story, since the ca cannibal would more likely eat the corpse than salute it. So here we go again with another maester ruining all the fun. And the exact quote from Fire and Blood is, It was said afterward that as the hull went down, the cannibal swept overhead. His great black wings spread in a last salute. A moving touch, but most likely a later embroidery. From all we know of the cannibal, he would have been more apt to eat the corpse than salute it. He was said to vanish after the war, and fans seem to think that he's still lurking around and could even be camping out in Skagos. I think that's how you pronounce it. And that's another island. It's close to the north. And it's volcanic. So that would be a good spot for the cannibal to hide out. And maybe in Winds of Winter, he exposes himself. I'm curious. Maybe there's a reason that there was no mention of what happened to him. Maybe he's going to reappear. Um, we'll see. But that's a really interesting concept. The cannibal surely lived up to his name. And he was just so fearsome because he was black, of course. Like, he had, like, that dark spirit. And he'd just kill everything. And he was so vicious and strong. So he's going to be an interesting dragon in the House of the Dragon as well. And it's going to be very fun to see him. I wonder, will they have someone mount him? Or will they just leave him as he is in the books, unmounted? It makes me wonder. Because, you know, they change around things at times. So that's what I have about the cannibal. Um, he's one of the wild dragons. And I enjoyed chatting with you. So I will talk to you guys next time. Thank you for listening and have a good evening.